year when we did them together. It was crucial for us to help each other and it taught us how to interact with each other. Also, by doing these activities, we made a bond that will last a lifetime. I made a lot of new friends and I still keep in touch with quite a few of them. We had to learn to trust each other. And a big part of our French of friendship is trust, which helped us. Before Ryla, I was afraid to take that first step as a leader. I was afraid to trust others to accomplish the task. This fear doomed me to failure of becoming a bad leader. But Ryla helped me. It made me take that first step and trust others. It taught me that sometimes you just have to jump right in and trust other people. It can be difficult, but it's something you have to do in life. Ryla helped me a lot, and it showed me that to be a great leader, I had to trust these people, and I can't accomplish everything by myself. As a leader, I needed to know, know this. I needed to know that I had to count on other people to get things done. Ryla helped me take that first step. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Space, the final frontier. These are the words of the Captain James T. Kirk of the Starship Enterprise, words that all Star Trek fans know and will always remember. NASA, in reality, is the agency that we use today to fulfill every Star Trek dream. With the help of its associate companies, it has advanced knowledge of the universe, our planet Earth, as well as it gives us many technologies on a day-to-day -day basis that we take for granted, such as robotics, Velcro, baby food, improved radial tires that aid traction control. These are but a few spin-offs that we gain from NASA on a year-to-year -year basis. But recently, NASA has been completely left out of this year's governmental budget, deemed unnecessary to continue exploration and continuation of the spin-offs that we acquire from them. Is this the truth? It is. The president recently signed into law the NASA Authorization Act, severely undercutting all previous budgets that NASA had. Ever since NASA was founded by Dwight D. Eisenhower in the late 50s, they've been working to advance our knowledge in both space, physics, creation, extraterrestrial life, and providing valuable consumer goods to us, the people. Currently, NASA is one of the leaders in developing alternate sources of energy, new improved robots, advancements in medical prosthesis, as well as gel packs that provide cold water to help uh, swelling go down from knee injuries. They also have their hands in food preservation that we see in products such as the creation of Jell-O, vacuum sealed packages, as well as other preservative methods. Leading our country into space with the launch of Yorick, a monkey that made the brave trip to space, they have been pushing the breaking point on what was originally thought to be impossible. Is this fair to all concerned? This is not fair at all, because NASA has had their funding severely cut. We live in a world that requires the advancements to survive and thrive as a species. Every year, as our nation alone, we use 2.5 billion barrels of gasoline a year. As oil wells start to dry up, the prices of gas will skyrocket. Putting solar power, wind turbines, and advanced research into geothermal pumps completely out of bind. Without a cap at the emission spectra that we look at, we need a price allotted amount to go into this to have any relative amount of electricity in the future. New medical procedures are brought to the new light when lasers were first introduced as a means of clotting blood during cancer surgeries, as well as my mom recently had her knee surgery done on Monday of last week. NASA has been working with a hospital that they have in Gainesville, Florida, providing new gel packs that specifically target key areas of the knee that was replaced to make sure that the swelling went down properly instead of the conventional ice pack that we try to use today. Without this technology, she probably would still be in the hospital because her knee would still be completely swollen. What we also see is that they provide us with new antibiotics because in microgravity, they have abilities to manipulate the bacteria that we don't have here on Earth. It isn't fair to pack up and quiet funding to an organization that has provided amputees with new arms and legs as a part of their research into more advanced robotics. We need NASA because no other organization or company has the type or resources or stability to allocate funds efficiently 
and to do both the research and design of a product correctly and accurately every time they do it. Will it, be good, will it build goodwill and friendships? No. Obama's current law has set an uproar in the scientific community. NASA is great for all those concerned as our planet continues to grow and fill its finite amount of space with houses, people, highways, and businesses. We will need a place to continue this growth. The fantasies of every Trekkie will be, have to become reality. But none of this will happen if we don't support the development of NASA. In conjunction with Russia and many other space programs, NASA has built the International Space Station. Currently, over 100 countries are putting in to help build the space station. But as of right now, this is the only means of us ever leaving this planet. Or ever, if our planet gets too filled with people, we have nowhere else to go. Will it be beneficial for all those concerned? NASA itself is beneficial to all concerned, providing millions of jobs for both research and design in over many different branches of companies. It not only provides jobs in the industry, but also provides research and developmental jobs as well. Velcro was once the awe of its time. Robotics is ours. Spaceships that can transport you to the moon for a small fee will be our future generation's legacy. If this great program is actually continued. Our planet needs more space. Resource wars will be incited if we don't expand our populations to more open and undeveloped areas that aren't so congested like the moon or possibly even Mars. Humans naturally are detrimental to ourselves. We overcrowd ourselves leading to sickness, famine, and disease. This can all be solved by the technology that NASA provides us. Space shuttles to get us to the moon, to Mars, or even the ability to launch us and keep us into space with like the International Space Station. Using these advancements that they provide, we can reach to the stars and maybe meet new life, if it's out there. Thank you. Ethanol as a fuel. One of the most important products that Americans use is their automobile. Everyone in this room can relate to at least one incident where their car breaks down and due to the great distance to work, the grocery store, or their home makes for quite an adventure. The most important product for our cars is gasoline. Without gas, every gas running vehicle's value is reduced to scrap metal. Therefore, the type of fuel we put into our cars determines our vehicle's efficiency, lifetime, and service requirements. However, gasoline has risen environmental concern about its contribution to global warming, and also, much of our oil comes from overseas from unsustainable countries. The popular solution for this concern is replacing the common unleaded 87 octane gasoline with E85 ethanol. The ethanol industry sales pitch is that ethanol reduces our carbon footprint, eliminates America's dependence on foreign oil, and it effectively replaces gasoline. But is this the case? Is ethanol the answer to our problems? To answer this question, I shall analyze it with the Rotary Club's four-way test. Number one, is it the truth that ethanol makes a smaller carbon footprint, eliminates our dependence on foreign oil, and makes a viable replacement for 87 octane gasoline? A carbon footprint refers to the amount of carbon dioxide released into the atmosphere. The ethanol industry claims E85 ethanol produces less carbon dioxide. Is this true? That is where being an AP chemistry student came into play. I calculated and double checked with my chemistry teacher that E85 does produce 5% less carbon dioxide than 87 octane gasoline when the two fuels produce the same amount of energy. But that's just at the engine. What about production? A corn plant, like all plants, converts carbon dioxide into oxygen. But according to an article from the Kansas City Star, written by Jonah Goldberg last summer, stated, quote, if all our transport fuel came from biofuel, we would need 30% more farmland than the existing food growing farmland we have today, end quote. The article then went on to say, quote, in Brazil and Malaysia, Biofuels are economically viable, thanks in part to really cheap labor, but at the insane price of losing rainforest while failing to reduce the CO2 emissions that allegedly justify ethanol in the first place. According to Matt Ridley from The Nature Conservancy, estimates rainforest clear cutting for biofuels releases 17 to 420 times more carbon dioxide from burning E85 ethanol. So that 5% less carbon dioxide 
from burning E85 ethanol translates into 85 to 2,100 percent more carbon dioxide altogether. So ethanol does not create a smaller carbon footprint. The term E85 represents a mixture of 85 percent ethanol and 15 percent gasoline. The added gasoline is necessary because the pure ethanol does not start a car very well in the winter time and pure ethanol has 25 percent less energy by volume than gasoline. However, even with the added gas, E85 ethanol still has 21 percent less energy by volume than 87 octane gasoline. This means drivers will have to stop more often for fuel or have bigger gas tanks to get the same miles on that tank of fuel, then the car would weigh more, requiring more energy to move the extra fuel. Plus, only 44.4% of the crude oil is turned into gasoline. The rest is turned into thousands of different byproducts, including asphalt, engine oil, transmission fluid, power steering fluid, brake fluid, explosives, toothpaste, prescriptions, floor wax, paint, glue, tires, pesticides, electronics, perfumes, footballs, fishing rods, and the list goes on. Ethanol is nowhere near as useful as petroleum. All of the byproducts that come from making ethanol are distiller's grain, carbon dioxide used for sodas and dry ice, and liquor. This won't ever replace the 57% of our oil that we import, so ethanol does not eliminate our dependence on foreign oil. As I said before, E85 ethanol contains 21% less energy by volume than 87 octane gasoline making ethanol far less efficient for trucks and SUVs that tow boats and haul equipment. If the drop in fuel power reduces the horsepower below the requirement to haul something, then the owner must buy a bigger truck, which makes it more expensive for the owner, and more people will have to drive heavier vehicles, consuming more fu fuel, and wearing down the roads faster. Also, due to ethanol's poor power output, semi-trucks, trains, and airplanes would not be able to use ethanol because of the high horsepower demand on these machines. Refining ethanol is also inefficient. Refining ethanol is a biological process that requires cooking ground corn twice into a liquid, adding two enzymes to change the sugars, add yeast to add to ferment for 48 hours, and after that only 10% is actually, is actually ethanol, which is removed and then boiled to separate the ethanol and the water. And finally, add the 15% gasoline. Refining gasoline is a faster process that requires heating crude oil to separate the large carbon chains from the small ones in a 150 foot tall fractional distillation tower. Then take the desired viscosity of petroleum to then use catalysts to crack the oil to change the, the, the chemical structure. Then add anti -knock, which makes the gasoline less volatile. In comparison, Refining ethanol takes three added chemicals, three times to heat, and at least three days to complete. Gasoline only takes two added chemicals, one that can be used repeatedly, once to heat, and it takes less than a day to complete. Refining ethanol takes more energy to do for less product, so ethanol is not a viable replacement for gasoline. Number two, is it fair to all Americans to convert all transportation fuel to E85 ethanol? Since the benefit claims of ethanol have been proven false, why change at all? If there is no real reason or advantage to do so, then it is simply a waste of time, money, and effort. Converting all vehicles to be E85 ready means shutting down oil refineries, building new ethanol plants, and making every farm, making every farm grow corn, and also making every more new farms will take a substantial amount of wasted time, money, and effort for a product that is less efficient and does not live up to its sales claims. Also, the ethanol industry is heavily subsidized by the federal government to make ethanol, ethanol cheap enough to be competitive with gasoline. Our tax dollars are paying for an unprofitable industry, and when we buy ethanol, we already paid for it in taxes. We are then paying for it at the pump, and we still have to pay the other taxes that are applied on the transportation fuels. So now we would have to pay for the fuel twice, and the expansion of the ethanol industry would increase the national debt considerably, further crippling our country in financial ruin. So it is unfair to all Americans to convert all transportation fuel to E85 ethanol. We'll con number three, will converting E85 ethanol build goodwill and better friendships? In the short run, it will build goodwill among some individuals. These individuals will feel good that they are part of a group that is helping the environment in our country due to the misleading advertisement. 
But the truth will sooner or later come out, either before we go full swing into ethanol during the research and funding stages, or when we are committed and we realize this is unsustainable. Whatever the case, in the end, those who really got into it will fear regret and a sense of loss when they realize that their efforts were meaningless and some will feel ashamed that they fell into this scam. A large transfer of jobs from the oil industry to the ethanol industry will bring a lot of stress among those individuals and their families. Uprooting a family and moving someplace else takes time and money. Some won't be able to do it. The rest will see a big rush to the Midwest, changing the balance of the economy between the states. So converting E85 ethanol will not bring goodwill and lasting friendships. Number four, will converting E85 ethanol be beneficial to all Americans? The trade-off of farmland used to grow food and to make fuel will certainly bring a sharp rise in food prices. Soy, corn, fruit, wheat, and rice will have to be imported. Plus, all of the cotton fields and grazing grounds for cattle will have to be converted into corn fields. As a result, the soil quality will decline rapidly, food prices will shoot through the roof, donations to food pantries would stop, and the global effort to solve world hunger will be at a devastating setback once American agriculture is taken out of the equation. Starvation will grow in our country and around the world just as it did in the Great Depression. Our need of farmland might also result in the need of territorial expansion, but the United States doesn't naturally go after land. We liberate, not conquer. In conclusion to the four-way test, ethanol is not the answer to our problems. It just creates more problems on the diplomatic, economic, industrial, environmental, and agricultural levels. Ethanol doesn't reduce our carbon footprint, it increases it. Ethanol doesn't make us energy independent, in fact, it makes us agriculturally dependent as well. Ethanol isn't a suitable replacement for gasoline, it causes more engine problems. <coughs> ethanol isn't fair to all Americans because it burdens our wallets and our government. Ethanol won't develop goodwill, only regret, scandal, and anger. Ethanol won't be beneficial to all Americans because it makes us hungry and poor. In the end, we should definitely not convert our vehicles to ethanol. It is a waste of time. But the science behind the development should be continued. Our understanding of alcohol creation and compact energy should be broadened for future breakthroughs. But currently, it would be a foolish thing to bring ethanol to the large scale of the, eth of the energy industry. Thank you. Good evening. A common tradition in this day and age, a happy-go-lucky 16-year-old prances in to receive a driver's license on his or her birthday. However, effective January 2010, this rite of passage for teens was altered. New driving restrictions adjusted how a driver's license is obtained. The goal is to change the behavior of those behind the wheel to improve safety and reduce accidents on the road. Already having my license, the changes did not affect me. I was interested to hear about the new regulations and imagine how I would have felt if I were one of the teens who may have had to wait a little longer before jumping in the car. So I applied the four-way test to the situation to reach my conclusion. The four-way test first asks if this is the truth. Yes, this is not a rumor. I did some research and found that changes were made to the graduated driver's license guidelines effective January 1, 2010, according to the Kansas Department of Revenue. Prior to January 1st, teens as young as 14 could obtain their instruction permit. It's kind of a scary thought. The instruction permit allows the teen to drive with a licensed driver over the age of 21. 14 year olds can still receive an instruction permit, however, they must have that permit for at least a year before moving up to the restricted license. In case you're unfamiliar with the restricted license, this is a license where the teen has limits as to where and when they can drive and who is in the car under different circumstances. Prior to this year, once the teen turns 16, he or she could obtain an unrestricted license or typical driver's license. Now, they can no longer obtain a typical driver's license, but receive a license with fewer restrictions, again regarding where and when they can drive and who is in the car. Then, at age 17, the teen can obtain the driver's license with no limitations and no restrictions. For the many teens who are not grandfathered around the new rules and regulations, this is the truth. Next, the four-way test asks whether or not these new driving limits and regulations are fair to all concerned. Yes. 
I struggle with the well-put argument of parents having to show further 16-year-old child. I also have to ask, is this fair to the teenagers who may have just turned 16? I put myself in the shoes of a mother or father or a 16-year-old itching to get out on the blacktop, and I can't help but feel that these new guidelines are fair. The convenience of the parents is strained, and the pride of the teenagers is wounded. However, considering that the safety of many individuals is involved, this is a fair matter. After reading on the Kansas Traffic Safety Office website that automobile crashes are the number one killer of teens, the reasons became clear as to why the change in driving rules are taking place. Car crashes nationwide are the number one cause of death for teenagers, and the highest chance of lifetime crashing occurs within the first six months of obtaining a license. The numbers of teen wrecks remain high, which makes me cringe at myself and the other teen drivers every day in my school parking lot. 1,500